My name's uh, Jim Del Grosso. I work for a company called uh, Sigital. And what Sigital does is we have about uh, 350 people that work for us, about 300 of us. Our entire focus is software security, which means we do things like penetration tests, we do code reviews, we do design reviews, uh, we help establish software security initiatives. Pretty much anything in the software security space is something that we do. And one of the things I like to talk about, because it's my domain at Sigital, is talk about uh, the fact that we spend a lot of time uh, focusing on penetration tests and code reviews, because it is one of the most cost-effective ways to do software security, but it's ineffective in finding certain types of defects. And I just want to make sure that there's as broad an audience as possible to know that there's another type of analysis you ought to be doing to find another type of defect and that penetration testing and code review have almost no chance of finding the types of problems we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so I run the architecture analysis practice uh, specifically. Um, I was a developer for many, many years doing lots of different types of development, all kinds of interesting things, embedded systems, satellite communications, uh, real-time TV before on-demand TV was on-demand TV. I worked with web applications. Uh, big systems, little systems, compilers, really, it's been a fun career. Um, I got into security about 15 years ago, and that kind of changed my mindset of what fun was, because now I get to help break stuff and defend against breakers. So we have a lot of good breakers in our organization, and defending against them is my full-time job. So it's, it's fun to go against our internal folks. Um, on the positive side, um, one of the other roles I have is uh, I'm the executive director for the IEEE Computer Society Center for Secure Design. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, about, uh, little bit more about that later, uh, but it's an initiative that was started by the IEEE to focus on design flaws in software. Uh, there is a lot of information available for uh, how to solve bugs, and there's good information about preventing those bugs, and there's very little information, in our opinion, uh, about basically how to design systems to be secure and avoid the whole bug problem uh, in its entirety. So we'll talk a little bit about that initiative um, a little bit later. So hopefully everybody's <clears throat> very familiar with the typical uh, software development life cycle. Uh, if you look across the bottom, typical activities that are part of an SDLC, whatever your, you know, whatever your, you know, uh, however it is you develop software, whether it's Agile, Waterfall, it doesn't matter, you most likely go through these steps somehow. So all the way from requirements, all the, all the way over to feedback, standard types of activities. Across the top are software security activities that more or less map to the SDLC activities. So if we're talking about requirements and use cases, if we were interested from a software security perspective, what would be of interest to us? It's gonna be how can I abuse the system? Who are the misactors? Um, what are my security requirements? Architecture and design, which is a little bit of what we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, we talk about design review, architecture analysis, threat modeling, goes by lots of different words, but we're looking at the design of the system. Uh, in a perfect world, we'd like to do it very early in the, in the life cycle. Um, if you're looking closely, you'll see risk analysis also happens pretty late in the cycle. Perfectly okay. Um, it's perfectly okay to look at the design of a system for flaws if you've never looked at the design of a system for flaws because you will find flaws in your system. So just because you've built hundreds or maybe thousands of applications and have not done a formal design review, you will still get a lot of value if you were to look at the design of those systems because you will find things because you were not looking for flaws when you maybe originally built the software. But the big thing for tonight is lots and lots of effort in the pen testing and code review side. Lots of good tools, free, commercial, um, all the way from kind of okay to very good. Uh, tools that can be customized tremendously for your environment, that are very effective at what they do, uh, very good for languages and frameworks. Lots of great stuff in the penetration testing and the code review side almost nothing in the design review side. There's really very little out there. It's just the nature of the beast. So just to set the stage, I want to make sure we understand the difference, at least the way we look at bugs and flaws. So if you look at the defect universe, right, the, 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 the problems that exist in software, they're pretty much broken up into a classification of bugs and flaws. And that line that looks to be about the middle is based on some papers that were written and from our own results of talking to our customers, when you're looking at the defects in systems, what's the ratio? It is about 50-50. So if you're only doing analysis that looks for bugs, there's half of, the, half of the defects that exist 
you're not finding. They exist in your software, you're just not finding them. So when we talk about the bug side, we talk about things like cross-site scripting, various injection attacks, buffer overflows. These are coding problems. Somebody wrote a piece of code a certain way, and it caused a bug in the software. Oftentimes, these can be fixed by changing the code in, in small ways, not big changes to the code. On the other side are design flaws. This is somebody who's built a control, uh, designed the control in such a way, but it's weak, it's missing, it's duplicated, uh, it can be bypassed. These are design problems. Uh, this was a real picture I took uh, while I was out at a, a, a client site, uh, which is an interesting way to apply a security requirement. The security requirement is you have to have a cable lock on your laptop. He had a cable lock attached to his laptop. He attached it to the desk. It's not attached to the desk, though. <laughs> I mean, right? Pick up the table, take the laptop. He felt he was following their security requirements. This is what we'll find in real life. People think they're following requirements. You're not following the spirit of the requirement. Right? This is pretty easy to bypass. So we have, these, we have this split uh, between bugs and, and flaws. So some tools that are available, uh, or, or at least techniques that are available for finding bugs are things like code review. It's exceptionally good at finding bugs. It scans the code, it looks at patterns, it looks for, it follows rules, different engines have different capabilities, and then those code review tools will identify this is a piece of code that has some sort of a security problem. Right? They're very good at that. It bleeds a little bit into the design side because it will occasionally highlight some sort of flaw, but it's not really what it's supposed to do. It's mostly in the bug side. Penetration testing is similar, but starts to bleed a little bit more into the flaw side. Um, it has the ability to identify some flaws, but it wouldn't really know that it's a flaw. Um, you'd have to actually do something like root cause analysis to realize, okay, this thing that you found through the penetration test is in fact a design flaw. There's a totally different type of analysis called architecture analysis, um, which covers all kinds of things like threat modeling, uh, like dependency analysis. That's the universe where you, its focuses on design flaws. Likewise, it bleeds into some bug type of identification, but it's exceptionally good at finding design flaws. It's a totally different type of analysis though. And if you're not doing something that's looking at the design of the system for flaws, you're missing half of the problems. So just out of curiosity, who's, who's either a developer here or manages a group of developers? Okay, fair number. Who is doing code review with either an automatic or manual? And what about penetration testing? All right, it's another similar, similar number. Who's doing secure design reviews or some sort of threat modeling? Bunches of people. Oh. It's so unusual. It's so good to see. It's so good to see. Okay, so this will be easy then, because we're gonna just compare some bugs and flaws. Uh, and since everyone is doing these types of activities, this should be easy. If you were to consider LDAP injection, LDAP injection is which one of these? Who thinks it's a bug? Who thinks it's a flaw? So we view that as an, it's an injection attack. It's, I supply data, uh, I confuse the parser, I can start to control what's going to the log. That's, that's a bug, it's an implementation bug. What about if I had a two-step authentication process where there was some hidden account on the client and as part, of that, as part of that second authentication mechanism, the client side performed the validation? Is that a bug? Who thinks it's a bug? All heads are nodding. No, of course. Who says it's a flaw? Yeah. That's just a broken design, right? We can't do client-side controls. It's extremely hard to do a client-side control. So what about allowing logs to be altered without detection? So the logs can be altered, and there's no way for you to tell that the logs have been altered. Is that a bug? Anybody for bugs? Anybody for flaws? Many hands go up. Awesome. Writing sensitive data to an application log that only is used for normal application logging purposes. Is that a bug? Is that a flaw? That's a bug. So if I choose to write sensitive data to the log, that's kind of on the developer side, at least our view, but it's, it's good that there's a difference of opinion out there. Uh, log injection. Log injection bug, flaw, 
no flaws takers, excellent. What about if I'm not tokenizing data, I have a bunch of logs that are being written to by a bunch of different uh, applications, and we all have our own way of representing some piece of data, and we don't tokenize that, so now log aggregation is a gigantic pain in the neck for those that have actually built systems like this where different components treat a piece of data slightly differently and write something just a little different to the log, and then your job is to go and correlate all that. Is that a bug? Is that a flaw? More flaws. Yes, different type of analysis to find these. And, and last but not least, on the crypto side, if I'm using a weak IV, a weak initialization vector, or key with a crypto primitive, is that a bug? Flaw? I know, we had this argument yesterday, but it's a bug. <laughs> so if you're using a weak key, you have the ability to use a strong key. We view this as, as a bug. If your design is completely hosed and it's the wrong primitive, different problem. But a weak key or IV with a primitive, uh, we view as a bug. What about a more obvious one which is using a confidentiality control where an integrity control is needed. Bug, any takers? Flaw, any takers? Yeah, this is a slam dunk flaw. Uh, this is one of the things that we see messed up uh, very frequently in the work that we do. Um, somebody thinks they're protecting the data and they protect the data with a control that is just not appropriate for the protection that they're going after. They're going after a confidentiality control but they're using some sort of an HMAC or vice versa. They think they're gonna prevent the reading or the confidentiality of the data and they use some sort of a tamper-proof control. Uh, so we see that one quite a bit. What about a hard-coded key in the source code? Is that a bug? Is that a flaw? So you're, this is one that everybody's right. So this is both because the bug is you've got the key hard-coded in the source code and what's the flaw for anybody out there? If I've got the hard coded, if I got a key hard coded in the source, what does that reveal about the design to me that makes it a flaw? No code review, you don't spot it. You have no what? No code review, so you don't spot it. No code review, so you don't spot it. No, but let's say you did spot it. It's it's going to reveal a flaw. Good. So they didn't think about it in the first place, meaning there's no key management solution. There's no, there's no way to understand how do I rotate the keys. There's, there was no thought provided for how are we going to do key rotation? What do we do when the key gets compromised? There's like a standard checklist that you'd want to go through. As soon as you know that you're using crypto and all the things that you care about is when are we going to need to change the primitive? When do we need to strengthen the key? There's a, there's a bunch of things that are going to come into play and this will prevent those things from being realized, right? It's just not possible to actually design a system that has a good encryption key strategy when the data is hard-coded. So it's just not possible. Uh, so just more examples, just so you can kind of see the split between these two. Pretty much any kind of injection attack, unsafe APIs, uh, things that a developer can make a mistake with, these are bugs. When we think about design flaws, uh, again, Wrong, wrong crypto for the, for the wrong purpose. Um, we have too much trust between components, right? We build a system and once you get beyond like maybe your initial firewall inside of your data center, everybody can communicate with everybody freely. It's probably not right. Uh, client side trust issues, this is a huge problem that we see in the work that we do, which is very strange in 2015, that client side trust is one of the most common uh, flaws that we find in our architecture review. Uh, but it happens all the time. People seem to forget <coughs> JavaScript is not safe, ActionScript is not safe, HTML5 is not safe, you can't store things on the client. You just, they make these simple mistakes because they seem to forget that it's a client device, mobile, of course, mobile devices, client devices. Um, so we have client-side trust issues and just some other examples, but completely different, uh, completely different types of, of problems to be had. So how are we doing? Uh, I got asked this um, in the middle of last year by my CTO, kind of on the spot. Uh, we had a bunch of us get together, and he's like, so how do, how do you think we've done over the last 10 years? And I gave him the candid answer, I think we suck, and we haven't gotten very good at, at what we do. And he was hoping that I was going to be on his side and say that we'd gotten better, and I was convinced we had not gotten better, but I didn't really have any data to back it up. So I thought, well, What's, an, what's one metric that I can go look at? And one of the metrics I could go look at was the OWASP top 10 over the last 10 years. And so I started looking at the OWASP top 10 over the last 10 years, and I felt pretty good that I was right, 
that we haven't really solved a lot of the problems that we've known about for at least a decade. We've known about these problems longer than a decade. This was just the last 10 years where it's been reported, at least by the OS top 10. So does anybody see any kind of pattern here? What's happening kind of frequently? How about with some color? <laughs> so if we look at injection attacks, it's arced and pretty much pegged itself up, up high. Uh, which is not so great. Uh, Cross-site scripting has been in the top four for 10 years. We have uh, broken access control, which kind of forked, and it has forked into insecure object reference and dipped way down and then started creeping back up. We have insecure config, which morphed into you can't store data securely to we screw up misconfigurations, and it's, it's now on the rise. If you look at these, Seven of these 10 have been the same for 10 years. I'm, I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, I guess you can have two schools of thought. One is we're not very good at this, which I don't believe is the case, because we have a lot of great information that talks about this. So what I'm hoping is that some of this is just really hard to solve. And we need to find a better way to try to solve this problem as opposed to looking at this and say we're not very good at it. But this data is not, is not encouraging, right? This is. This is not a great trend. I mean, I think there's one. Uh, CSERF is the one that's dropped. Uh, XSS has dropped a little. And those are kind of interesting to me because if you try to think about why did CSERF, why did cross-site request forgery drop, I have no data to back this up. But if you wanted to guess as to why CSERF dropped from, 10, from 2010 to 2013, any, any guesses as to why cross-site request forgery may have dropped? Framework support, that is my view. Any other ideas? I mean, I actually think that that is why it dropped. I think we've made it harder for developers to screw up, the, basically to, to cause cross-site request forgery to, to occur. More? Oh, mobile, well, why not? If the mobile app, is, if the mobile app has a web view, it will yeah. certainly, it'll certainly work. It, I mean, if you write the web app in not in pure native UI, yeah. And again, we see that, which is how I, I know CSERF works in mobile apps, only because we see people create a web view and they kind of forget that it's a web view that you've created on a mobile app. Uh, mobile attacks will still work just nicely. Um, so mobile apps may, may, native mobile apps may cause a bit of a drop. Frameworks may cause a bit, a bit of a drop. I don't know exactly why. Uh, what about cross-site scripting? Uh, a steady decline. Well, I mean, not, not like it's yay, yay, we dropped a lot. It's, it's dropped at least a little bit each year. Again, any ideas why cross-site request forgery, or sorry, cross-site cross scripting might be on the decline? SAPI? It's SAPI. It's SAPI, dare to dream. I don't think that that's as widely adopted to cause an impact, but it, dare to dream <laughs> that that might, be, that might be it. Any other? Again, I, I, I don't know if it's that tools have gotten better at, at, at identifying to developers where the problem occurs and we started to fix it. Maybe it is a SAPI, I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit of you know, things like CSP that are helping. You know, browsers have started to make it um, easier for us to avoid the problem. So if you have um, an application that is running inside of your ecosystem and you know your browsers are all modern browsers and all support things like the content security policy, you can write applications where a cross-site scripting attack is gonna be way harder to launch. It's going to be way more challenging to launch. Uh, is, that, is that what happening? I don't know. But there's been a steady decline over at least the last six years, a little bit. Uh, it could be that the data behind this is not good. I don't, again, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the, the exact origin of this data. Uh, but it's a little bit interesting that there has been work done on browsers. Tools are exceptionally good at finding this. We have more applications being pushed to a platform where it's a little bit harder. But if that's the model that's going on, I think that is I mean, that is the way of the future. Can we create frameworks that make it more challenging for a developer to screw up, and so it's easier for them to do the right thing, and we avoid some of these problems completely, but I mean, I would like to hope that maybe in 2016 or 2019 that some of this stuff vanishes, right? This is a, it's 10 years. I enough with this, right? We need a new, we need a new 10. So it'd be great to get some different, a different top 10 in here. So anything that can be done to do that, we're all, we're all for. Well, 10's an arbitrary number, yeah. I mean, it could be, well, first of all, this should not be your top 10. This is an OWASP top 10. As to why they picked 10, I don't know. 
uh, in your organization, you can have your top seven, three, one, 15, whatever number makes sense for you. Uh, I, I'm sure there's some marketing scientific thing for picking 10, but I don't know what 10, I don't know what the magic of 10 is. So if you have two heads, you can keep, <laughs> I don't, yeah, no, no, yeah. I thought, yeah, so whether it's, yeah, the, the number of things you can keep times two, and we hope you can double, double down on that two, that, that seems reasonable. Um, and then, so the other interesting thing about uh, what came out of the new top 10, so what the gray things mean is the, the, the gray items are the ones that fell off the list, and of course, ones without an arrow coming into it is brand new. Um, so we had this one new uh, entry, which was using components with known vulnerabilities. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a sec, because that's actually something uh, that we also see a fair amount of. And, and when we do what we call architecture analysis in our, in our world, um, dependency analysis is the, is the thing that ties back to uh, known vulnerabilities with the software that we bring in into our universe. So I just wanted to talk a little bit um, about the IEEE uh, to let you be aware of what the IEEE org is, is doing. Um, it's a global organization. It's open to the public. Anybody that's interested uh, in working with them, uh, you're more than welcome uh, to, to you know, participate. It's, it's completely uh, you know, volunteer, if you would. What they wanted to do <coughs> was um, figure out what can, uh, what can the IEEE do uh, to help promote this idea of uh, finding flaws and raising awareness about a finding flaws. Um, so they reached out to some folks in the industry, uh, in both academia as well as the private sector, and what we all kind of agreed with was code review and pen testing, uh, and doing any kind of work in that space was probably not gonna was probably not gonna help, and that we needed to come up with a different set of checklists, something else that could help people uh, never forget to think about these things when you're looking at the design of software, just like we have checklists for. Um, you have a browser, there's your standard web attacks that you need to think about. Uh, you have certain types of APIs or certain frameworks, here's the stuff you, sh you shouldn't forget to think about. And so we wanted to do the same for design. Um, none of this activity is meant to replace pen testing and code review. If you remember back to one of the early slides, it completely complements the tools that are available for finding bugs. So this checklist is going to be added on to the workload, unfortunately. It doesn't replace the workload. It, it makes it harder for us. Sorry. Um, you have to do more work uh, or get, get people to do the work. Um, so in the tail end, uh, the late 2013, uh, the IEEE, uh, Kathy Clark Fisher uh, in particular, who was the uh, lead editor for IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine, uh, she's the one that wanted to start this new initiative, the cybersecurity initiative in the IEEE. And the whole idea was to raise the IEEE's presence in cybersecurity and tackle this problem of, um, you know, what, what is a problem that nobody is solving? What's a problem that's existed for quite a while? And again, the decision was, um, how can we help bring awareness and, and raise awareness of helping people stop designing software with a bunch of flaws in them? And so the focus was going to be on the weak design. So in March of 2014, uh, we held our first uh, workshop, and these are the folks that uh, showed up at the workshop. So we had uh, some pretty big names uh, that, you, that you'll see there. <coughs> uh, I hope certainly, I would, maybe some of the folks there in particular uh, you, you've heard of. Uh, we had you know, tool vendors. We had, of course, uh, uh, security people. Uh, we had Google. Uh, we had Twitter. Uh, we had some universities, uh, we had a little mix. Um, folks from all over the, well, not all over, but we had some international presence. And what we all did was uh, we got together and the idea was we all came to this meeting with a homework assignment. When, when this meeting started, we really had no idea if there was gonna be any common ground for design flaws that we're seeing out in our respective spaces. So the homework assignment was everybody bring the top flaws that you see in your space, in your domain. And we were going to talk about <clears throat> what are the types of flaws that we see, what are the types of flaws that we fix, because the important thing about that was these are flaws that don't necessarily see the light of day. They get fixed internally. 
So for those that have software security initiatives and do this work internally, these things get caught, they get fixed, but they don't make it to some top end list. They're, they're fixed before they become public. And so what this group did was uh, we all dumped our top flaws on the, on the desk, quite literally. Uh, we talked about them all, and we ended up coming up with a category, and in, because 10 is a magic number, there were 10, 10 things, uh, 10 things called out. So <clears throat> uh, the 10 design flaws to avoid <clears throat> are, are, are listed there. Um, I'll let you read them, but this is where you can go to, it's a downloadable PDF, uh, it's HTML uh, as well if you want to read it online. But if you look at these, they're not in an order of one to 10 because we had no data to quantify how frequent something happens, just that um, five of the 10, five of the 13 saw this, seven of the 13 saw this, so it made it into the list. But this is not an order of importance. And, and in fact, this order of importance will be different for you and your organization. But if you look at this, this, this earn or give but never assume trust, client side trust issues, this was happening in a lot of places. It wasn't just us that saw this as a, a, huge, a huge problem out there. Um, having an authentication mechanism that can, can't, can't be bypassed, that kind of tracks with OWASP, right? Bypassing authentication is a pretty common problem, uh, but that, that's a flaw that we want to avoid. Um, we found uh, that there were a lot of groups, a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations were finding flaws where there was no authorization being done after authentication checks. So there was identity management, but then there wasn't an authorization check to verify that the, the entity was supposed to be able to do what they were trying to do. Um, of course, the land of injection attacks, um, right, separating data and control. Um, obviously, this shows up very frequently. Uh, so we made the general, kind of the generalized uh, case of, well, the real problem is we're not separating and controlling data, and that applies to all kinds of parsers, not, not just browsers, log files, and, and any kind of other standard ones. Um, of course, data validation, another big item, making sure that data can be explicitly validated. Uh, crypto was a hot button. Uh, crypto was being used incorrectly uh, very often. Uh, it's one of those crypto, I think the easiest way to describe this is crypto is easy to use and hard to get right. Um, it's just one of those challenges with crypto. There's a lot of nuances to using it correctly. And if your application is using crypto, you really ought to have a crypto person review the design. It's no more complicated than that. It's very hard to get that right. Um, it was surprising how many uh, organizations had problems figuring out what sensitive data was and how it should be handled. Uh, it, it seemed to become a problem when it made it someplace it shouldn't, yet everyone was shocked that there was no data classification system in place. But when the data got somewhere, they knew that that was sensitive data and it shouldn't have been there. But no one actually told developers that it was sensitive data to begin with. So that was kind of interesting. Um, this was, I think this kind of ties directly into that new entry on the OWASP top 10. Um, lots of folks uh, have a pretty good handle on the fact that when you bring external software into your application, you get all the security debt that goes with that. And what is security debt? It's the potential vulnerabilities that exist in that software. So you need to understand there's a certain risk. You get these features that come with the software and you get some risk potentially that comes with that software. It's not just the, it's just not just the capability that the software provides. It could also be some, some dangerous behavior that the software provides. And so understanding how to configure that software, how to disable features you don't need, all of that starts to matter. And so that became an important, uh, an important thing to call out. And then of course, being able to react that um, there's a vulnerability that's found, we have to modify our software, um, how can we change the design in the least impactful way? Uh, when you actually think about that when you're designing the software, when something bad happens, and every organization that was there had a very good use case of where something bad happened, um, you need to be able to change out a chunk, of your so a chunk of your system to replace it with something else. So planning for that turned out to be a pretty important thing. So again, these were, these were the top 10 types of, of designs to avoid, and there's some guidance on there uh, to talk about it. Um, in fact, we're having, <clears throat> Uh, our next workshop in a month. And what we're hoping to do is, um, if you go and you look at the current write-up, we're gonna go one level deeper 
uh, talk about uh, these 10 problems in more detail. And what we're hoping to do is pick a framework, um, one of the more popular ones, hopefully, and then think about how can the framework apply, what, what features of the framework can we apply to these 10 categories? And see what, if we can provide some advice to developers that are using that framework that uh, if you want to you know, make sure that authorization has occurred after authentication, here's how you would do that in the framework and provide some concrete advice. Again, I think the more we can get hooked in with framework providers and have them do the heavy lifting for the developers, the, the better it's gonna be for everybody. I think we have a good chance of preventing some of these problems that are just occurring over and over and over again. So just a couple of, of quick examples, um, quick examples for this. So one was, if we look at strictly separate uh, data and control, uh, again, the, the universe of injection attacks, uh, there's this paper that was written by Christoph over at uh, Google. If you get a chance, uh, go read the paper. They had, um, what they've done internally is they've created their own framework for developers to use with the explicit intent to prevent cross-site scripting. So they built this framework to prevent one type of bug. But they didn't go to all the developers and explain to them over and over again that you prevent cross-site scripting by doing output encoding in all the right places with all the right contexts. What they did was they created a framework for the developers to use such that it was much harder for them to write code that would not do encoding in all the right places. Now, it took a little bit of learning for the developers to make use of this framework, but what they ended up seeing was a drop of a small number of cross-site scripting attacks. They didn't have that many anyway because they've got awfully good uh, developers, but it dropped from a small number to zero. Now, does that mean that there's zero cross-site scripting attacks in their code? No, of course not. It means that they were able to find some and then they were able to find none, which is kind of promising. So they created a framework that made it harder for developers to have this problem of cross-site scripting. Developers started using this framework. What they basically did was, instead of the, you know, the, the universe of places where a developer would have to know that I've got to encode this data this special way when I'm, gonna, I'm about to send this to the browser, they basically created a choke point that said when this untrusted data is gonna to go to the browser, we're gonna route it through here, and when we route it through here, we know exactly what data is trusted and untrusted, and we'll encode it in this one spot. And by doing that with this framework, they were able to reduce their, their number to, now they can't find any problems. Again, it doesn't mean there are no, no problems. That's the joy of, of security. Just because you can't find anything doesn't mean that there isn't anything. It just means that they didn't find anything. So it's, again, pretty promising. But it seems to be the right kind of idea. Build a framework that makes it harder for the developer to do something dangerous. Uh, and that's what they did. And, and that's an interesting, I think, an interesting real life example. On the using crypto uh, correctly side, so everybody familiar with these two icons? Yeah? Heart bleed, triple handshake, the delightful attacks of, of yesteryear. So if we look at these um, and we're talking about flaws, which one of these does not belong on this slide? If we're talking about a flaw, which one of these is a flaw and which one of these was a bug? Yeah, heart bleeds a bug. The triple handshake is, a, is more affirmation that the protocol is broken and, and shouldn't be used. So, but this is one of those, this is one of those issues where understanding that, uh, you know, crypto is hard to, it's hard to get right. Well, not the bug side, that was a, that was a developer, developer problem. But, but recognizing that the crypto is hard to get right, there's going to be flaws in some of the software that we use and we have to have a, a plan for swapping out something. You need to have that in your, you need to have that capability built into your design or you're gonna run into these, again, many of the organizations that were at this workshop ran into this you know, fire drill where these bugs came out on the surface and all of a sudden there were you know, thousands of applications that were now vulnerable because these attacks were well known. And there was a big, a big headache of trying to get this fixed right away. There were some of the guys that were on that list disappeared for two months trying to solve this problem inside of their own organizations. Uh, so again, big, big kind of issues. There was this other, uh, other example of understanding how integrating external components changes your attack surface. And ironically, this seems to be a perfect example where Heartbleed does apply. So anybody want to guess as to why Heartbleed, which is a 
bug itself, but why it applies to how integrating external components changes your attack surface? It is, it's a part of OpenSSL, and, and why does that matter to you? It matters to you, well, A, if you're using OpenSSL, but not only if you're using OpenSSL, if you're using a piece of software that's using OpenSSL, right? This, this debt kind of flows and, and follows forward with you, or uh, with the software that we include, uh, you know, in, in the software that we're building. Um, I, had a, I had a different slide that I, uh, I showed earlier, I, I may just pull it up, um, that, that showed you know, a vulnerability in, in Ruby on Rails. I'll, I'll probably go snag it after this, but, but understanding that when we're including software inside of our application, it, it changes our attack surface. It creates the capabilities for attackers to do bad things to our software. We need to understand that. Uh, there is, again, it's, it's that saying there's no free lunch. Uh, sometimes, uh, sorry, it gets a little checkbox there. Uh, sometimes we have to recognize that when we, when we pull that software into ours, uh, we're going we're gonna to have this problem. So just for grins, uh, let, me, let me go pull up just that other slide so you can get, I think, a pretty good understanding of, of how external software kind of screws with us. So this was something I, I showed at, uh, at SecAppDev. <clears throat> um, you're using Ruby on Rails, that's great. Gets lots of features. Um, if, if an attacker is able to tell that you're using Ruby on Rails, one of the first places they will go to look for vulnerabilities to attack your system is NVD, right? The National Vulnerability Database. They're gonna, these are published attacks against software. So if I know you're using a particular piece of software, I'm going to look here to see what does everybody know about. This is what the bad, this is the bad guy's toolbox, right? So this was a search uh, that was limited to just the last three years because they didn't want to go too far back to be not relevant. Um, there were 42 records returned in the last three years. Not every one of these are going to apply to you. But the fact is there are 42 reported vulnerabilities against Rails. You would, you should, if you're using Rails, you should look at this list and make sure that none of this applies to your universe. But where I thought this got interesting was right on the first page. If you look at the second one on this page, and this was run just a few days ago, um, there is this multiple directory traversal vulnerability in Sprockets, and Sprockets is part of Rails, and so Rails has the vulnerability because Sprockets has the vulnerability. Well, that is exactly the problem you have when you pull in Rails. The vulnerabilities that are built into Rails carry forward and get passed on to you. So all the vulnerabilities that they inherit from the software they include comes forward to you. And this applies to all the software that you're pulling in, not, not just one. So think about the number of components you have. And if you're not doing some type of review like this, to think about all the known attacks against all the software that you're pulling into your application, this is exactly step one for bad guys. There's, there's exploitable code available for many of these. They know exactly how to break into your systems if you have the right parameters where these vulnerabilities make sense. But this is step one for the bad guys. So understanding that this debt carries forward is an important piece of the puzzle for getting started. Um, so I thought I, was only, I thought I was only talking for you know, 35, 40 minutes, not, not the hour. So I'm done with what I needed to present. I can talk more. Uh, if, we, if you want me to go for an hour, I can certainly talk for an hour and talk about some architecture analysis stuff. Or do you want to take a break now, or do you want to hear about three, three types of analysis that you'd use to do architecture analysis? The that one? All right. Well, ironically, it's in this slide. It's in this deck. <laughs> All right. So I'll make sure. So I'm supposed to end at a quarter after? Yeah. All right. I'll be done by a quarter after. So the way that you, one of the things you can do in order to find the flaws in your system, um, there's three types of analysis we think you ought to consider. Uh, the first is dependency analysis, the second is known attack analysis, and the third is system-specific analysis. Uh, software has this delightful emergent behavior that when you take a piece of software by itself that worked perfectly well alone, and another piece of software that worked perfectly well alone, and you put those two pieces of software together, they decide to not work nicely together anymore. That's, 
Emergent behavior of software, that's life. Um, so there's that system spe specific analysis. It's not a known attack, it's something unique to the way your software is built. It's not a dependency analysis, it's just a different type of analysis. So when we talk about dependency analysis, your software is built on top of lots of other software. Where it gets interesting from a software security point of view is, we're going to see in a minute, well, I'll just skip over that, there's the inherited debt uh, of, of the features and the bugs or the flaws that come along with that framework. But is there something I can do to disable those features? Um, just because a piece of software has 50 different types of functionality, if I only need two and I can somehow disable those other 48, I want to disable those other 48. Every time I can disable something that I don't need, I reduce the attack surface. There's less chance of something bad happening. But you have to most likely proactively do that. Software generally comes installed with every feature enabled, and you have to kind of jump through hoops to turn stuff off. But if it's possible to disable features, you want to disable features. Um, you have to understand the security controls provided by the software that you're including because you want the software to be as secure as possible for you to use it. Again, most vendors are not going to release the software to be in a secure by default mode. It's all features enabled mode, which is exactly opposite of what we need. So on the dependency analysis side, uh, those are the things that are, are of most interest to us. Uh, disabling features that we don't need, understanding the security controls provided by the framework so that we can secure it as best as we can for the way we're going to use it, and making sure that we understand we get this inherited debt with the software. So that's dependency analysis. Uh, known attack analysis, there is a wealth of information about how these attacks work, right? Books and books and books have been written about it. Um, you can rest assured the attackers know exactly how the attacks work. They've either read the books or they are the cause of people to write the books. So they know exactly how to attack the system. Um, this list of known attacks is, from a defensive point of view, exactly the types of things that we have to make sure that there are controls in place to prevent, and it's exactly what attackers are going to start with, because attackers are inherently lazy, and they're going to go for the easiest thing first, right? They're not going to try some crazy zero-day exploit. They're going to launch some basic attack at you and hope it works. That's, that's the nature. So what are the defects that show up uh, most often? Uh, I, this has been driven uh, home, I think, a couple times now. Client-side trust is big. Um, missing or weak controls from a design point of view. A way to bypass a control, the control's not there. Uh, we're not doing something correctly. And then these are just some of the standard examples. And then the, one of the other big items is some sort of session management, uh, some sort of session management problem. Um, I'm going to quickly go through these, just because we don't have a ton of time. But when we're talking about known attack analysis, um, as you look at your system, there's some standard types of patterns that systems fall under. Um, you may have a distributed architecture, and when you have a distributed architecture, there's standard types of attacks that you should immediately think of, and you want to make sure that you have controls in place to prevent. Uh, maybe you have dynamic code generation, same deal. What are the controls in place to prevent those? So on the distributed side, I have network components. I have components communicating with each other. All the things I need to worry about. Can somebody listen in on the conversation? Can somebody tamper with the data? Um, can somebody, maybe they can't. Uh, the slight difference between observing and eavesdropping, this is intelligent reading of the data. This is observing some sort of encrypted data. But I can, if I look at the data just right, or if I can control the data, even though it's encrypted, I may still be able to get some information. Uh, can I replay? If you've got a distributed system, and you've got components communicating with other components, you have to at least think about this. And did you create controls in order to prevent this? Can man in the middle not happen? Is replay not a possibility? Uh, is, am I sure nobody can observe and tamper with the data? You have to at least consider those. This is exactly what an attacker is going to do. If we look, about, if we look at the dynamic code generation <coughs> side of things, um, then we're looking at all the places where data is getting parsed. It's not just browsers. It's not just JavaScript engines. It's not just um, client-side uh, things. We have databases. We have XML parsers. There's lots of things that parse data. When the attacker can control the data that's going to be parsed, and I can basically make the parser screw up its logic and start to execute a different command, this is the land of 
well, it's injection attacks, but it's this dynamic code generation problem. That's the more general, more general case. It's not just about the various injection attacks. There's other types of problems that can happen here. So it's, it's the standard problem of code getting misinterpreted, sorry, data getting misinterpreted as code. Um, so again, if you've got some sort of a parser uh, somewhere in your system, standard type of attack you're going to want to think about, this gets hard to solve because it requires some sort of data flow analysis. Tools are pretty good at this if it's a robust tool because it can do what's called taint, taint analysis, uh, but this is not so easy for a human to do. It's very difficult to track um, how code flow or how data flows through a complex system. Uh, but figuring out and understanding the safe APIs is easy for us to do. And so preventing or frowning upon the use of dangerous APIs that allow for data to become code is what we're trying to avoid, and, and that we should be in control of. For the stateless protocol side, standard types of attacks. Um, can the attacker predict your state management ID? Can the attacker capture whatever you're using to maintain state or session? And can they basically create a perfectly good ID and get you to use it so that both the attacker and you know about the ID, which is a fixation attack? So if I've got some sort of state management, which again is not just for classic session IDs, it's any time you're maintaining state, right? No matter what that might be. Could be web service calls, could be a REST API. Could, anytime you're maintaining state or flow, these types of attacks matter. Can an attacker predict what you're using to, to identify this user to you? Can they get a user to use one of their IDs? These are all the things that are interesting. And then you're going to want to make sure you have controls in place to prevent these. So right, we're in the known, the known attack analysis side. All well-known attacks to the bad guys. On rich, on basically client-side code. Uh, years ago, it was just things like rich internet apps, but now it's not just rich internet apps anymore. There's things like HTML5, there's mobile apps. Lots of processing are being, are, has moved over to the client. And again, people seem to have forgotten that that is the client. And nothing over there is trusted. And nothing over there is trustworthy, and nothing that you get from over there should be treated as anything but garbage. And then you have to verify it and make sure it's valid and, and do all your standard checks. Uh, so we've made it um, easier uh, for programming to happen, but it is still a client. It is still an untrusted platform. And just because I've got this exposed server endpoint that only my software is supposed to call doesn't mean an attacker just can't start calling that endpoint directly. It's an exposed endpoint. The fact that your software, whether it's a mobile app doing some back-end you know, communication, yes, there's no browser that points to it, but as soon as a hacker or any kind of you know, malicious user looks at the traffic leaving their phone to your server and sees the endpoint that's being called and the data that's being passed, they can tamper with that as much as they like. And so interesting things can sometimes happen. Right? When there's an exposed endpoint, it's a public endpoint. It doesn't matter that it's only supposed to be used by your app. That's not what the attacker cares about. They'll use it however they see fit. And then the fifth type of common uh, design element is uh, when you have things like um, either service buses or queues. So queues work by guaranteeing delivery of a message. And so a couple things of interest for that is, first of all, depending on how you've credentialed access to your queue, anybody with the set of credentials can most likely read or write messages onto that queue. Uh, what we see many times is there's too many components that share the credentials to access the queue, and they really have very different functions. And so we have a least privilege design problem. So we can easily find those types of issues. One other thing to keep in mind is it is a queue that guarantees delivery of a message does so by doing something called store and forward. It will store the data somewhere, and it will forward the message onto the client whenever the client says, I'm ready to take the data from you. Storing that data means that there is an opportunity for some malicious user to extract that data when it's no longer sitting on the queue, credentials or not. It's stored somewhere. That may not be OK for your system. That data may not be allowed to be stored on disk in an unencrypted way, for example. And so you may have to not just use channel security, which is what this last one talks about. You may actually have message security that you need to implement even though you may also have SSL on the, on the communication channel, so no one can intercept the message or tamper with the data and have that control for that purpose. But if you need to make sure that the data can't be read when it's at rest, 
a Q means the data is at rest at some point. An ESB means the data is at rest at some point. It sits somewhere. And so you'll need to decide, do you have to also encrypt the data as well as the channel to get you the right type of protection you need? Again, just, these are just standard attacks that you have to think about when you're doing the design of your software. Uh, the last one is uh, system-specific analysis. And so this focuses on the things that are unique to how the software was put together. So these are just some examples. Um, we try to talk about following uh, good design principles. We talk about looking for weaknesses in custom protocols, a place where things go, uh, go wrong quite often. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, again, these are just examples of, of system-specific. The problem is, with system-specific analysis, we can talk about a technique for doing it, but that's way too big for, uh, for this meeting. Um, and in fact, what we do is something called threat modeling, which is probably an abused term in, in lots, of, lots of the industry. But threat modeling is a technique where we identify um, something that's attacking the system, which is for us the threat agent, a person or code acting on behalf of a person that means to do you harm. We identify assets which is data or functionality that needs to be protected. We identify the attack itself. This is what the bad guy is trying to launch against your system in order to get bad things to happen. There is the attack surface. This is the part of the system that the threat agent interacts with. So you can imagine you've got an external uh, unauthenticated hacker in pick your favorite country trying to break into your system. They don't have direct access to your database in your data center. Right? The attack surface for them is the public endpoint they would have to somehow break through that first layer in order to launch an attack against your data center. So it's, it's important to think about what's the attack surface for different threat agents. An authenticated user, on the other hand, by design is allowed to interfa interface with your system in a very different way. They can send messages to you, uh, they can tamper with the data that they send to you in all kinds of ways, and so they have, they have a different attack surface. So we talk about the attack surface, and of course we talk about the goal, what's the point of the attack? Sometimes it's to pivot into something inside of, your, inside of your world, either your data center or your LAN, and launch an attack from there. So pivoting is an important part of, of, the, of the goal. Sometimes it's just to subvert um, a system by itself. And then, of course, the last part is the security control. And the security control is the thing that prevents the threat agent from getting to the asset. And security controls do not always completely mitigate a problem. We need to mitigate the risk to an acceptable level for us. And that's a combination of business risk, data, uh, what the system does functionality-wise. There's, there's no single answer for this. And, and that's why this system-specific analysis is one of the most difficult types of analysis to do. It's driven by all kinds of factors, um, generally very specific to the application. What is it doing? Who are the users? What's the business risk? And of course, then it becomes, what's the actual attack? What's the likelihood of that attack? Um, is my control in place good enough that my risk is now down to an OK level, that I accept the risk that if this were to happen, the cost to fix it is prohibitive. I'm not going to pay the cost to fix it. But these are intelligent decisions, as opposed to I have no idea what the risk is because I didn't do this type of analysis. So again, after this, it talks about the actual threat modeling uh, process, which is just way too, way too long for, for this. But, but those are the three types of analysis that make up um, finding flaws. It's understanding dependency, uh, dependency analysis. It's, it's basically walking through your head with known attack analysis, all the, all the known attacks that exist out there. So whether you're looking at you know, OWASP as a source with their, uh, what is it, a ASVS? What is the? Uh... No, 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 it's, uh... isn't it ASVS? ASVS, right? Yeah, it's got the list of 16 categories of standard, it's basically a rehash of KPAC, which is the common attack pattern enumeration classification thing. Anyway, it's, I know OSP has a, a list of standard types of attacks. So you gotta be thinking about the standard attacks. You gotta be thinking about what your software is built on and the weaknesses that come with it. And then you have to do this other type of analysis which is unique to how you've built your software. Uh, there will be flaws in there that do not show up with dependency analysis, nor do they show up with known attacks because they're not known attacks. They're just how you built your software. And so you've done something not quite right, and you've created a weakness in your system. So that was everything I needed to cover. And hey, I extended to where I'm supposed to. So yay, yay for me. <laughs> questions, about, questions about anything? 
No questions? Understand all this? Do you believe any of it? It's all true. I, I promise it's, it's true. You will, first, so you got, there's a lot of folks here that are doing threat modeling. So for those that do threat modeling, are you finding stuff that's not found by your code review and your pen test practice? A couple head nods. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a couple hands up. Yeah, you, you certainly ought to. Um, and just out of curiosity, when you do your threat modeling, do you have a tool? Anybody using a tool? Nobody's using a tool. Yeah, so I, we haven't found a tool yet that works either. Um, we kind of, uh, we're kind of stuck. Well, I don't know if we're stuck, but we use Visio um, and layers. So it allows us to draw components easily. If you have Visio and a stencil, it's way better than nothing. Way better than nothing. Um, a, no matter who in your organization draws the threat model, anybody can look at it and know exactly what's a threat agent, what's a control, what's an asset, what's a component, what's in scope, what's not in scope, what a, what a connection line looks like, what it means. Have, get a standard way of representing your model, whatever it is. Um, you know, if you're, if you're big into DFDs, Microsoft has their threat modeling tool, but it's DFD driven. Um, it's not for me, but uh, if, you, if you live in the world of DFDs, they do have a tool. It's free. It doesn't require a Visio license anymore. Their original tool did. The new one does not. It's still pretty heavy. I don't know what other word to use because there's lots of data flowing through a non-complicated app. If you have a complicated app, there's a lot of data flowing and there's a lot of things to draw. So I, I, don't, I, think, it's, I think it's too expensive time-wise to populate that thing uh, and I don't think it finds everything. Uh, but that's, about, that's a tool that exists. Skybox. Not familiar with Skybox. What is it? Is it a network scanner? But if it's a network, so all right. So maybe this wasn't clear, but everything that we've talked about is application layer security. Yeah. So I mean, if if there's something wrong with your network. Your application won't know anything about it because <laughs> you should have zero input on what the network looks like where your application gets de deployed. So this is all about application layer security. We expect firewalls to be in place between certain trust zones, but when we actually do our threat modeling, we do actually create trust zones, trust boundaries. And the reality is oftentimes what creates those trust boundaries are network layer controls as well as things like you know mutual SSL between servers so that only two servers are allowed to talk to each other even though there's lots of servers on the network segment only two servers are allowed to talk to each other because we're the only ones that have each other's certs so there's things you can do at the application layer to restrict who can get to you and these are some of the things you would do when you're thinking about the attack surface um, I've worked with a lot of companies that once you're inside the data center, it's a free-for-all. You're inside the data center, it's a, it's, a, it's a protected network and everybody can talk to everybody. And it's like, are you kidding me? What's protected about it once you're inside? And so as soon as you can pivot off any server inside the data center, you can hit any other server in the data center. It's absolutely crazy. But that's the world some, place, some people live in. Um, others take a much more restrictive look that no server is allowed to communicate with another server without a key exchange. And that's, again, that's another extreme, which is more interesting. Because unless you configure servers to talk to each other, they will not communicate with each other. Seems way better. Is it a bit more complicated for the ops team? Sure is. Sure is. Safer. More complicated for ops. Oh well. Pick your poison. Any other questions? Thanks. I guess it's a break for 15 minutes. 15 minute break.